Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Almighty God be upon all of you. Welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth. And we're talking today about Muhammad in the Bible. And we've been going through some of those verses in the Bible that indicate, that show, that might show us that Muhammad is the Prophet of Allah foretold in those scriptures. Certainly, there are people of the book, rabbis, Christian priests, emperors who recognized Muhammad for what he was. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, the last and final messenger. Let's have a look at Isaiah, the book of Isaiah in the Bible. In the 29th chapter, in the 12th verse, there's something remarkable here. And it says, and the book is delivered to him who is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. This passage is remarkable. First of all, the Prophet Muhammad is referred to as the unlettered Prophet, the unlearned Prophet. The Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, couldn't read and he couldn't write. He did not study scripture, not like Jesus, who was brought up amongst the rabbis and even at a young age, he amazed people with his learning of the law. So Jesus, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, was learned in the law. But Muhammad lived in Arabia, a pagan land. People did not know about the scripture, except for a few people amongst the children of Israel, some Jewish tribes who lived there. Otherwise, they were ignorant of that. And the Prophet Muhammad himself was not learned in the scripture. And he's called Ummi. Ummi means not learned. And so it's exactly as the Bible is saying, the book, and one of the names of the Quran is Al-Kitab, the book, is delivered to him who is not learned, who is Ummi, saying, read this, read this, in Arabic, Iqra. Read this, Iqra. The very first verses that God revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, as every Muslim knows, what was it? Iqra. Read. The angel Gabriel comes to the Prophet Muhammad, while the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is meditating on the mountain, the Jabal Nur, the mountain of light overlooking Mecca. He is sitting there meditating. He has escaped the troubles of Mecca, the polytheism. He goes there to think about God, about creation, about humanity. And it is there that he receives on the night of Ramadan in his 40th birthday, he receives, the angel Gabriel comes to him, says to him, Iqra. And the Prophet says, I can't read. Again, the angel Gabriel says, Iqra, but this time he takes the Prophet and squeezes him. And again, the Prophet says, I cannot read. Now the angel Gabriel squeezes him even more tightly and says, Iqra, read. The Prophet says, what shall I read? So this is exactly what happens. The Prophet says, I am not learned. I cannot read. How can I read? I'm not of those who can read. This is exactly how it is mentioned in Isaiah 29, 12. Check it out for yourself. And I must admit that when I first was reading the life history of Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, as a Christian who used to be familiar with the Bible, I remember that passage from the Bible and how exactly it fitted the passage I was reading about the life of Prophet Muhammad and what happened in this event that I had just described. It was truly remarkable. Also, Isaiah in the 42nd chapter, verses 1 to 13, I'm not going to read the whole of it, but it refers and speaks about someone who is beloved to God. And he is mentioned as being from the descendants of Kidar. Now, who is Kidar? Kidar is, in fact, the second son of Ishmael, a direct ancestor of the Prophet Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. It seems very clear from these statements in the Old Testament that the Jews were expecting a prophet to arise from amongst the children of Israel, descended from Kidar, that he will bring a law, he will be like unto Moses, and that obviously many Christians who had studied the Old Testament or what they had, or whatever scriptures they had, recognized these attributes as well. How about the Gospels? Do we have any hints as to the coming of Prophet Muhammad in the Gospels? Well, there is a passage. It is quite a controversial passage, even to tell you the truth, amongst Christians. 
But let's read it. It's in John, in the book of John, the Gospel of John, in the 14th chapter, and it is the 16th verse, and it goes, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So, the word, as we find it in English, is comforter. There's a lot of controversy about what is the actual Greek, parakletos, what is this word actually mean? But some scholars have said that the word actually in Aramaic means Ahmed. Ahmed is indeed the very name that is mentioned in the Quran of the Prophet Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. That's one of the names of the Prophet Muhammad, Ahmed. And this is the name that he is referred to in the Quran. And the Quran says the Gospels refer to him as Ahmed. And actually the, uh, the word Ahmed in Aramaic means the comforter or it is similar to the word Greek word parakletos that is used there. And it's interesting that he will abide with you forever. The final comforter after this there will not be another. Let's look again. Let's look in John 15 in verse 26. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Another fact, of course, that Prophet Muhammad testified to Jesus. The Quran mentions about Jesus and the Prophet Muhammad made it. And Allah has made it a part of our religion that we cannot be a Muslim unless we believe in Jesus, of course, we believe in Jesus as we believe he truly was a prophet of God and the Messiah to the children of Israel, not as it is falsely claimed part of God and the son of God, which we believe is a blasphemy against God. So John 14, 26 tells us, but the comforter, the Holy Ghost, whom the father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And John 16 and 7 to 14 verses says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. An important thing I want to mention here. Some Christians claim the Comforter is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that inspires them and helps them to speak in tongues and so on. And this is the Holy Spirit they claim that, you know, fills them and guides them. However, there's a problem with this because Jesus says, if I don't go, the Holy Spirit will not be able to come. Yet the Holy Spirit is with the disciples while Jesus is there as well. So to say that this comforter is exactly the Holy Spirit in the sense that Christians understand it doesn't seem to fit the verses. In fact, if we understand the Holy Spirit to be the angel Gabriel, that's what Muslims believe. Ruh al-Qudus is the Holy Spirit. Ruh, Spirit, Qudus, Holy. Ruh al-Qudus is in fact the same, one and the same angel Gabriel who brings down the revelation. So the new revelation will not come. The Holy Spirit will not come with a new revelation until Jesus has left. So Jesus has to go for the comforter, for Ahmed, for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to come. And it says, and he will reprove the world of sin and of judgment and, and of righteousness and sin because they don't believe in me, of meaning they don't believe in Jesus truly as the Messiah. Not as God and the Son of God. No, this is a false belief about Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah that was foretold in their scriptures. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you will see me no more. In other words, if there is no prophet with the people, then it is so much harder for them to follow God's guidance and to be righteous. And of judgment because the price of this world is the prince of this world is judged. And I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you unto all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, he shall speak. Do you remember that? What we read from Isaiah, what we read from Deuteronomy 18, 18, it is the same words repeating themselves. He does not speak of himself. He does not speak by his own desires. 
He speaks what is revealed to him. Jesus is repeating those words. And he will show you things to come. And one of the things we're going to be showing you in a forthcoming episode are the prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad. How the Prophet foretold about things that are going to come to pass. And we can see those things happening right in front of us these days. And he shall glorify me. Meaning he shall glorify Jesus. How? By telling the truth about Jesus and keeping people away from the lies that have been told about Jesus. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. We're going to be talking about more about this passage and discussing a little bit more after the break. Don't go away. Stay with us for the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad in the Bible. The proof that Islam is the truth. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth. And we're discussing some of the statements in the Gospel of John about the comforter, the paraclete. Uh, there's controversy, we admit, about these passages. Even amongst Christians, it is very controversial. But it's interesting that Rudolf Bultmann, in the Gospel of John, a commentary, he says, the paraclete is a parallel figure to Jesus himself. And this conclusion is confirmed in the fact that the title is suitable for both, meaning both Jesus and the comforter. So he must be like Jesus, he must be similar to Jesus. And it is clear from 1416 that the sort, there were sendings of two paracletes, Jesus and his successor, the one following the other. So what we see, as I have described, how this description of the comforter is so suitable for the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. And it is perhaps these verses in the chapter, in the, sorry, the Gospel of John, that those Christians understood as to be referring to the coming of the Prophet Muhammad. Certainly, when you combine those things with the other prophecies in the Old Testament that we have been talking about in Deuteronomy, and how God will make a great nation out of Ishmael, who on earth could that great nation from Ishmael be, if it is not the Prophet Muhammad and his companions and the great civilization founded upon the belief in the one God, the worship of the one God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the Quran that calls us to respect and love Moses, Abraham, Jesus, Noah, the Prophet sent to the children of Israel. They are mentioned in the Quran. Who else could it be? Who else is this great nation if it is not the Ummah, the nation of Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. So I hope if you're a Christian, or if you are perhaps a Jew watching this, this has given you something to think about. Certainly, the Muslims, I am sure, their faith will only be enhanced and increased because of these amazing things. Now, I want to read a really fantastic, it's a long story, it's an amazing story and it's well worth reading. And it's the story of a man called Anselm Tormida. And he was a priest and a Christian scholar. And he was a person who wrote a book. He converted to Islam. And he wrote a book, The Gift to the Intelligent, for refuting the arguments of the Christians. And in the introduction to his book, he writes the story of how he became Muslim. It's really fascinating, and especially in respect to the paraclete. And who is the paraclete? So... Let's go through it. It's a long story, a fantastic story. I'll do my best to get through it, make it interesting. First of all, this Anselm was born in a city of Mallorca. And as he mentions, he describes Mallorca and that big merchant ships used to come there to the harbor with different goods. Uh, and he's mentioning that the city is a city and an island both at the same time. Now he says that his father was a well-respected man in the city and that he was his only son. And when he was six, he was sent to a priest who taught him the gospel and logic. That's obviously common in those times that the priests, in fact, were the only people who were really learned and they could read and write. And they were also, many of them, well instructed in philosophy. So he learned the gospel and logic and which he finished in six years. So this is by the time that he was 12. I lived in the church with an aged priest. He was greatly respected by the people because of his knowledge and religiousness and asceticism, which distinguished his, him from other Christian priests. 
Questions and requests for advice came from everywhere, from kings and rulers, along with presents and gifts. They hoped that he would accept their presents and grant them his blessings. The priest taught me the principles of Christianity and its rulings. I became very close to him by serving and assisting him with his duties until I became one of his most trusted assistants so that he trusted me with the keys of his room in the church and the food and the drink stores. He kept for himself only the key of a small room where he used to sleep, I think, and Allah knows best that he kept his treasure chest in there. I was a student and a servant for a period of 10 years. Then he fell ill and failed to attend the meetings of his fellow priests. During his absence, the priests discussed some religious matters until they came to what was said by the Almighty Allah through his prophet Jesus in the gospel. After him will come a prophet called Paraclete. It's interesting that he says, after him will called, come a prophet called Paraclete. They argued a great deal about this prophet and as to who he was among the prophets. Everyone gave his opinion according to his knowledge and understanding and they ended without achieving any benefit in that issue. I went to my priest and as usual he asked me about what was discussed in the meeting that day. I mentioned to him the different opinions of the priests about the name Paraclete and how they finished the meeting without clarifying the matter. He asked me, what was your answer? I gave my opinion, which was taken from interpretation of a well-known exegesis. He said that I was nearly correct, like some priests, and the other priests were wrong. But the truth is different from all of that. This is because the interpretation of that noble name is only known to a small number of very well-versed scholars. And we possess only a little knowledge. I fell down and kissed his feet, saying, Sir, you know that I traveled and came to you from a far distant country. I have served you now for more than ten years and have attained knowledge beyond estimation. So please favor me and tell me the truth about his name. The priest then wept and said, My son, by God, you are very much dear to me for serving me and devoting yourself to me. Know the truth about this name and there is great benefit, but there is also a great danger. And I fear that when you know about this truth and the Christians discover that, you will be killed immediately. I said, by God, by the gospel and he who was sent with it, I shall never speak any word about what you will tell me. I shall keep it in my heart. He said, my son, when you came here from your country, I asked you if it is near to the Muslims and whether they made raids against you and if you made raids against them. This was to test your hatred for Islam. Know, my son, that Paraclete is the name of their prophet Muhammad to whom was revealed the fourth book as mentioned by Daniel. His way is the clear way which is mentioned in the gospel. I said, then sir, what do you say about the religion of these Christians? He said, my son, if these Christians remained on the original religion of Jesus, then they would have been on God's religion. Because the religion of Jesus and all the other prophets is the true religion of God. But they changed it and became unbelievers. I asked him, then sir, what is the salvation from this? He said, oh my son, embracing Islam. I asked him, will the one who embraces Islam be saved? He answered, yes, in this world and the next. I said, the prudent chooses for himself. If you know, sir, the merit of Islam, then what keeps you from it? He answered, My son, the Almighty Allah did not expose me to the truth of Islam and the Prophet of Islam. 
until after I have become old and my body weakened. Yes, there is no excuse for us in this. On the contrary, the proof of Allah has been established against us. If God had guided me to this when I was your age, I would have left everything and adopted the religion of truth. Love of this world is the essence of every sin. And look how I am esteemed, glorified and honored by the Christians. And how I am living in affluence and comfort. In my case, if I show a slight inclination towards Islam, they would kill me immediately. Suppose that I was saved from them and succeeded in escaping to the Muslims. They would say, do not count your Islam as a favor upon us. Rather, you have benefited yourself by entering the religion of truth, the religion that will save you from the punishment of Allah. So I would live amongst them as a poor man of more than 90 years without knowing their language and would die amongst them starving. I am and all praise is due to Allah on the religion of Christ and on that which he came with and Allah knows this from me. So I asked him, do you advise me to go to the country of the Muslims and adopt their religion? He said to me, if you are wise and hope to save yourself, then race to that which will achieve benefit for you in this life and the next. But my son, none is present with us concerning this matter. It is between you and me only. Exert yourself and keep it a secret. If it is disclosed and the people know about it, they will kill you immediately. I will be of no benefit to you against them. Neither will it be of any use to you if you tell them what you heard from me concerning Islam or that I encourage you to be a Muslim for I shall deny it. They trust my testimony against yours. So do not tell a word whatever happens. I promised him not to do so. He was satisfied and content with my promise. And I began to prepare for my journey and bid him farewell. He gave me 50 golden dinars and then I took a ship to the city of Mallorca where I stayed with my parents for six months. Then I traveled to Sicily and remained there for five months, waiting for a ship bound for the land of the Muslims. Finally, a ship arrived bound for Tunis. Anyway, he goes on to mention how he went to Tunis and he got off the ship and the Christian scholars who heard of his arrival came to greet him because he was famous. He'd become famous by this time for his knowledge. And so the Christian scholars came to greet him. But instead, indeed, he went to embrace Islam. So this is the story of Anselm Tormida and of course how he recognized, how his teacher had recognized the paraclete was in fact Prophet Muhammad as had been mentioned in the Injil. Join us next time for another episode of the proof that Islam is the truth. And until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Allah be with you always and may Allah guide us all closer to the truth.